Thanks for coming. So my name is Eyal, I'm CEO of Lobstra. So we, we heard about the, we heard about the MEV market. Let's talk a little bit and understand. Uh, first of all, what do you need in order to get a piece of the pie? And second, the title of the presentation is uh, DeFi trading every millisecond count. So I want to really to try to uh, try to talk about it and understand whether indeed every millisecond count. So DeFi trading, of course, is very competitive. Usually on a competitive environment, infrastructure is very, uh, is, uh, is very important in order to get, uh, uh, to get a gain. Usually on a competitive environment, every millisecond count. But on the other end, Ethereum with a change to uh, after, the, uh, after the merge, now as a 12 second a slow time, so maybe a millisecond is not, every millisecond is not that important. So we'll talk, uh, we'll definitely talk about it. First of all, let's understand the, the life cycle of transaction and really what, what create the MEV, okay? So transactions are being created and are being placed within a block and blocks are being uh, uh, finalized within the network. Now, Transactions are being created anywhere in the world. You don't really know who is the uh, who is the creator of the transaction, whether the transaction is starting in London or whether it's starting on the uh, on the US or a different area. Transaction might be created from a wallet working with a, an RPC or maybe from a, a program of a specific uh, DEX. You don't you, you really don't know. Now, many of the transactions in the block are regular transfer, moving assets from one address to the other. They don't create any opportunity. But some transactions are really creating opportunity uh, for searchers. Those can be very large uh, swaps. Those can be liquidation, uh, adding liquidation into, uh, into pools. That can be a liquidated event. It can be even NFT, although it's not uh, DeFi, but NFT can create a, create a opportunity and so on. So those transactions, which again, you don't really know where they are going to start. I call those the trigger transaction. Those are the transaction that basically create the opportunity to make money. Why, why, why creating money? For example, let's take an example, a large swap. You somebody is creating a large swap within Uniswap, if that swap is changing the price with Uniswap versus the price in a different DEX in Sushi, then a searcher can, uh, can extract the different price and, uh, and make money. Buy in one, uh, in one uh, DEX and sell in the other and, and create money. If a transaction is large enough that you know that it's gonna create a, 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 make a change in the price, then a searcher can sandwich the transaction. Can, if the transaction is buying, the searcher can buy before the transaction and sell immediately after the transaction and makes a lot of money. So those are the different uh, MEV type that Brian talked earlier about arbitrage and uh, sandwiches. Those are the, the those are the transactions that create the MEV, and again, those are being created from trigger transaction. Okay. So, what we are talking about here is how do you capture the how do you capture the the MEV, and what is important in order to capture the MEV? Why latency is important when you want to capture a MEV? And we'll talk about Ethereum specific also because it's different than uh, the other AVM with the change with the PBS and understand where latency is important through the PBS slide. So whether performance is important is really determined by, by the chain, by how blocks are being created. 
how often blocks are being created and who is creating the blocks, okay? So on Ethereum, blocks are being created every 12 seconds by block builder, okay? On BSC, validators are, being, uh, are creating the blocks and that's very similar to a mining pool uh, before, the, before the merge. And on BSC, blocks are being created every uh, three seconds. There are a bunch of other EVN network. I don't want to talk about them because honestly, MEV exists only on those two things. Okay, majority is on uh, Ethereum. The rest is on BSC. All the other chain is like a fraction. So let's start. Let's start with uh, with uh, Ethereum. Number one uh, difference between Ethereum and the other chain is that Ethereum supports bundles, okay? And the entity that creates the majority of the blocks are block builders. So first of all, what is the, uh, let's, let, let's take a look for a second on the life cycle of creating a transaction until it gets into the block. User through the wallet create the transaction. Transaction, Majority of the transactions are public. They, they, uh, they arrive to the mempool. There is nothing, by the way, like a mempool. Every node within the network has its own mempool. Searchers see the mempool. Majority of them using our, net, our service, for example. See the, see the mempool identifying the trigger opportunity that we discussed earlier. And and create their order, create their transaction to extract the MEV, okay? In order to protect themselves, they are creating a bundle. What is a bundle? A bundle basically is a, a set of transaction, it can be a, a single transaction, two transaction, three transaction, and so on, that they submit to a block builder. And the block builder basically get all the bundles, Simulate them if they transact one of the transactions in the bundle fails, but for the most of the bundles basically drop them. Saw them by the how much they are paying, how much the searcher is willing to pay the uh, value to the block builder or to the validator, and and order the transaction within the block in order to maximize the value of the block. Okay. <coughs> So that's how it goes to the relay eventually and the validate. So as I mentioned in Ethereum, every slot is 12 seconds. It's the, one of the biggest change from a proof of work. In proof of work, you couldn't really know when the next block is going to, uh, uh, to be created. In Ethereum, it's very clear when the next block is going to be created. So as a, a searcher, as a validator, as a block builder, as a, a relay operator, you, keep, you need to keep thinking with regard to the slot start time. So everything that I'm gonna to present today is with reference to the slot uh, start time. And if today you're not thinking with slot start time in, uh, in mind, you need to change that. So let's take a look on uh, two or three examples. Example number one, we are talking about background. Background is the arbitrage, it's basically <clears throat> trigger transaction, and right after the trigger transaction, you want, as a searcher, you want to include your, your transaction to capture the enemy. So we know that the block, the next block is at uh, 12, 0, 0, 10, so 10 seconds after 12, and we see in the mempool a transaction P1, that's the trigger transaction, paying gas price of 20, uh, 20 uh, and we're seeing that exactly at 12.00. So 10 seconds before the block time. This is, we are the searcher, we are searcher number one. We are creating our opportunity. It took us 10 milliseconds to submit our opportunity. That's, by the way, very slow, but 10 milliseconds is fast, so we are happy with submitting our, submitting our transaction. It's a bundle. So we're submitting a bundle of two transactions, T1, which is the trigger transaction, and two, T2, which is our transaction. 
for our transaction, we are quoting a price of a gas price of 50, more, more than the 20 from the trigger because we want to win the, the auction and we're waiting. A second searcher actually took seven seconds. That's like forever in crypto, okay? Seven seconds, but they use the gas price of 150. And guess what they want? So seven seconds after us, and we pay blocks route to get millisecond for everything so fast, and we, we were beaten. Why? Because in this example, millisecond is not important. In this example, what's important is to quote the gas price, okay? Is to pay enough uh, bribe to the block builder or the validator in order to get into the slot. <laughs> Second example, exactly the same thing, only that we see the mempool transaction 10, 10, uh, 10 seconds after uh, 12. So one second before the block uh, time. Again, it took us 10 milliseconds. We sent our, our bundle, the second searcher. This time it didn't take him uh, seven seconds. It, it, took, it took them only two seconds, but they were too, too late. Their, their bundle arrived after the block, uh, the block uh, time. So in this case, we won. In this case, uh, trader number two was too slow. So definitely latency was important for, uh, for uh, searcher number two. <coughs> Let's talk about DEX sex uh, uh, trader. So in this, in this scenario, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of activity on a centralized exchange, Binance, for example. Through the 12 second slot time of Ethereum, I might do five or 10 trades depending on the activity. And then I have the chance to submit one trade in my block, okay? Obviously, the signal that I'm gonna get from Binance is going to affect the trades that I'm gonna do on, on chain. So I want to delay my transaction as soon as possible because I'm going, getting more and more signal from, uh, from, uh, from Binance. Millisecond here, super critical. Okay, latency, super critical. This is, so sometimes latency is gonna be critical in identifying trigger transaction, and sometimes latency is, is gonna be super critical in executing your transaction. It's depends. So I like to think about the slow time in Ethereum as basically as 12 second slow time. The first nine second, the first nine second, take all the time in the world. Nobody, that's not going to affect whether you win or not, okay? The next two seconds from nine to 11, you need to start, uh, you might lose here because you are too slow, okay? And the next two seconds after that, and the reason why I'm going all the way to 13, because sometimes the searcher might win submitting even after the slow time because it takes the validator sometimes and we're gonna see that it, it might take a validator one second to get the block and that gives you an opportunity even to win after the slot start time. But the last two seconds, if you don't invest in latency, you're not gonna win, okay? So overall, you, you can see that about 40% uh, of the opportunity in terms of times, in terms of time in Ethereum, latency is not that critical. However, majority of the transactions in Ethereum are actually coming in the last uh, few, uh, few uh, seconds in the slot. So in terms of time, you have time in the beginning, but there is definitely less opportunity, a lot more opportunity coming towards the end of the slot. Okay, BSC is a di completely different story. Although today with validator, we see more and more validators that are testing some MEV solution. Still the majority of them are not using a, a, a MEV solution, which basically means that they are 
sorting transaction in the block based on gas price and time of arrival. Gas price and time of arrival. So as a searcher, you, you again, you see transaction, trigger transaction in the mempool. You act upon it. You create your transaction. You submit your transaction. There are no bundles in, a, in BSC. So you submit your transaction. And you are trying to get into the validator, uh, to get into the block of the validator as close as possible to the trigger transaction in order to extract the, uh, the MEV. So exa example on Ethereum and on BSC block, block time is three seconds. So let's assume block time is three seconds after 12. Again, we see a trigger transaction with 20 uh, way at exactly uh, 12. As a searcher, searcher number one, we acted after 10 milliseconds. Unlike Ethereum, our gas price must be 20 as well because there is no bundle. So if I'm going to be 50 like I did in Ethereum, the validator is going to put me in front of the trigger. I'm going to end up in front of the trigger. I'm not going to extract the MEV. So I must use the same guy. Now I can go maybe 19, but then uh, others, a different searcher is going to go with 20. So I must go 20, yes. Quick question. Why aren't there any like standard these bundles? So I'll, I'll reply in a second, okay? okay? So a different searcher took 15 milliseconds. That's uh, too long. So on BSC, we have customers that are struggling for 200 nanoseconds. Okay, not millisecond. This is this is how ridiculous BSC has uh, uh, become. So we're talking about nanosecond, and definitely every millisecond count. Now the the question here was why there are no bundle. In order to have bundle, you need a validator needs to run some software to support it, and the validator on BSC up till now they were they basically got the message from the foundation not to use anything that is not approved, okay? And they are, they are at risk of getting slashed. Right now, in the last month, the BSC is telling them, try something new, so that we do see, and even Blobsart is coming with a MEV solution, so we do see some change, but up till now, it was a clear message from the foundation, don't do it. So BSC, latency is super critical. Okay, so let's go back to Ethereum and look on the Ethereum uh, block lifecycle. Starting from the left, the searcher that identifying the trigger transaction in the mempool create bundles. Majority of them create bundles or submit private transactions, so we can talk about that in a second. Submit the, the bundle to a few builders or maybe to blocks route and ask blocks route to propagate it to as many builders as possible. Builder create blocks, submit the blocks to an entity called MEV Relay. Most of the builder will send to several MEV builder. Searcher has the incentive or the goal to land in the next block in order to do that. They want to submit to as many builder because they want to increase the chances that they will land in one of the blocks that will win. Builder has a uh, goals to win the next block, so they will submit their block to as many relays as possible. And validator basically register with one or several relay, get an auction, get a bid from the from the relay from the highest block, and uh, and pick the the block that will win. Okay, so. Let's actually start now from the end and go back to the beginning. Validator request, it's called get header request. If you heard about it, it's called get header request. Request a bid for MEV relay. Okay, if, as a searcher, if our bundle arrive to the block builder after they get a header request, we lost. There is no chance that we are gonna win because at that time, the 
the validator already picked the block. As a builder, we need the block to arrive to the relay prior to the get header request. And the relay needs to finish the verification, making sure that the block is valid prior to the get uh, 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 header request. And of course, as a searcher, I need to submit my bundle or submit my private transaction, submit my mempool transaction to the builder prior to the time that the builder finished building the block that the builder sent to the relay. Now, builds are constantly updating blocks and sending to the relay, but as a searcher, if you remember what we discussed earlier, I want to pick the right time to submit my bundle. I don't want to do it too early if, I, if, I, uh, if I'm relying on external signal, but I also don't want to do it too late. So this is, those are the areas where, where latency is important. Definitely for searcher, for block builder, if block builder takes too long, if relay takes too long to simulate the, the, the block, and obviously for validator. So a few tools that are coming from blocks route that are free for you to use. If you are not familiar with them, uh, you should. The first one is TX Trace. TX Trace is a tool that will tell you where blocks route so each transaction in the world. So this is especially important when you're analyzing trigger transactions. So if you, are a, if you are a searcher and you want to know whether you are fast enough, you can check what time did I hear about the trigger transaction, what time blocks are so the transaction, and if you have more than one millisecond difference, you need to invest in infrastructure. BDN, BDN Explorer will show you where transactions are coming from in the world at least where Blockstrout is hearing about transaction in the world. And if you see that a lot of the transactions, for example, are coming from Germany and on BSC, you might want to run your bot also in Germany. So that will help you to improve your infrastructure. Compare script, again, is a script that allows you to know whether your infrastructure is on par with, uh, with the other. So, in order to win in DeFi, it's basically two things you have to take care of. One, identifying trigger opportunity. So that means seeing transaction and block as soon as possible. And the second thing is basically to execute better. Whether it's sub submitting a mempool, public mempool, private transaction, or bundle faster. Okay, so a few slides on that. This is the uh, how to get faster on the mempool. We talked about find the, using TX trace, find the, uh, where trigger transaction is and whether you heard about it fast enough. Compare your infrastructure if you're running your own node. If you are using, anyone here using Infura for trading? Good. And if you are using Infura for trading or Alchemy, Run this, you'll see that you are two seconds behind. So, so this will allow you. A few other things. If you are using the default, if you are using the default uh, default services from a node, like for example, pending transaction from a node, you are already like 20, 30 milliseconds behind everyone else. Uh, if you are not running in the right region and you are competing, like say, let's say on BSC, or you're competing over the last second in Ethereum, and you're, you're, running, in a, you're running your node in, in Amsterdam, you are 15 milliseconds behind anyone else, everyone else, okay? Uh, why, why, why is it important to run on the same, on the right region, for example? Again, think about the last second of the slot. <laughs> Say you are running in Amsterdam, and the trigger transaction is from Virginia. So it's going to take you Amsterdam, Virginia. It's going to take you 40 milliseconds. Probably I'm wrong. 40 milliseconds to hear about the trigger transaction. 
your bot is super fast. 500 nanoseconds, you submit your bundle, you submit your transaction. The builder is in, in Virginia, so it's another 40 milliseconds to get to Virginia. You're already 80 milliseconds behind your competitor that is running in Virginia. Okay, so this is why it's so important to invest in infrastructure to to go global if you want to compete with the with the big one. So this is the BDN Explorer, allow you to identify the the right region to work with. So, okay, let's talk a little bit now that we understand how to identify trigger transaction faster or at least the tool, let's talk a little bit about execution, okay? So, how can you get faster? First of all, uh, if you're running your own node, you wanna make sure that your node is clear with the right uh, peers. Every node has a limit on the number of peers that it can support. So, let's say you're running a node with 50 peers, and 49 of those, the, the peer automatically get, uh, uh, the node automatically get uh, the peers. 49 of those are basically a develop, developers that working in their basement, running an Ethereum node, and you got those, you're not gonna get any trigger transaction from those, from that uh, developer. You're not gonna get any block from that developer. You might, you might get it, but you're gonna get it in 200 millisecond delay. So that's why it's so important to pick the right peer. And it's also important, and it's also important for execution. If you, if you submit your transaction to your peer, it goes from your, from your node to the peers, another peer until it's reached the builder. If you are connected to the wrong uh, peers, it's gonna take time. Also, if you're not using your node and you're using an RPC, pick the right RPC. Uh, some RPC, well, actually gonna have a slide for this. So here's a slide that basically show a benchmark of different builder providing RPCs and the inclusion, inclusion rate, okay? So let's take the, let's take the leading, leading builder today is, it's, it's changed every hour, but let's say builder 69, amazing builder. Okay, Builder 69 is somewhere here. Yeah, it's the, it's the, the blue here. And I think this is Flashboard. This is Builder 69. Sometimes it takes five, five blocks to get included within if you submit to the RPC. Why? The builder is getting the transaction and is trying to get it, is, is putting it in their block. If that builder is not winning a block for five, slots, you have to wait for five slots, okay? Some RPCs, block slot is an example. Our goal is really not to, to win the builder market, but really to provide a network propagation. So what we take is we take the transaction and we send it to all the builders here and a few others. So that's why with uh, our RPC, you will gonna get one, usually sometimes two, but usually one, uh, one, one block uh, inclusion. So it really depends on the goal of the RPC. But if the RPC is a builder and you're using it, you are at a risk of delaying your transaction. <clears throat> if you are not familiar with relayscan.io, Relay that's the number one explorer uh, in the uh, MEV boost. Very good, it's showing you the leading uh, relay, showing you the uh, leading uh, builder, definitely use it. In terms of builders, there are basically two types of builders. The names I made, so infrastructure builder and searcher. So infrastructure builder like Blockstrout, like uh, Flashbots, like Builder69, Blocknative, a builder that get transaction from the mempool, get transaction uh, bundles from other searcher and trying to compile the best block possible, okay? Different type of builder are searcher. Those are actual traders, market makers. They, 
Again, get transaction from the mempool, get transaction from other searcher, include their own traits and create a, a, a Unfortunately, because I don't think it's good, we are gonna see more and more a percentage of a builder space go, goes through the searcher. They are right now by far, the, they're probably like 60 or 70% of the builder space owned by three or four guys. Uh, Mark and Mary, they have a huge advantage and uh, because they are creating very valuable trade and because of that, they are creating very valuable, uh, valuable blocks. Okay, so how do you get to the builder? We talked about, well, you can submit your mempool transaction. Eventually, it's going to get to the builder. You can use the builder RPC, which I told you that there's a risk associated with it. You can build, you can use an RPC uh, that is more of a network like blocks route and there are other as well to get to the builder. And you can use, also use private transaction. Private transaction actually in the last one month, probably private transaction in blocks route uh, tripled the number of transactions. So we have today uh, probably like 5,000 private transactions a, a day. A lot of searchers finding private transaction to be to have a lot of a better inclusion rate than bundles, and they are submitting that. So that's a, that's another way to get to to the builder. All right. So when are blocks ready? So what I did here, I basically looked on uh, 800 blocks, looked on the winning winning block and find out when exactly the relay got those blocks. And you can see that by average, 109, 149 milliseconds before the, before the slot it, uh, starts, the relay received the, uh, the block. So as a searcher, if you are submitting your bundle, I would definitely recommend, if you want to wait as, as Light as possible. Don't uh, wait uh, past uh, 300 milliseconds uh, before the slot time because you need to give the builder time to, to build the block. So when you submit the block, you can control to which builder you want to submit the block. Remember, a lot of the builders are searchers, so they might compete with you. Okay, <laughs> so. If you trust them, submit to all the builder. If you don't trust them, then pick the one you want to submit. Uh, remember that, uh, let's take Beaver Build as an example. Usually 20, 25% of the blocks goes to that builder. If you are afraid that builder, Beaver Build is a competitor and they might steal your MEV, because if they get your bundle, they can see your transaction. If, they, if, if you are concerned, don't submit to Beaver, but you have you basically lost 25% of the of the chance to win. So it's a big that's that's why I said that I don't really like the, what's going on right now. <laughs> and uh, and you can also use a UUID bundle. UUID bundle are basically bundles that you can update all the time, which is. A great thing for researchers that want to delay their, delay their transactions. So you submit one two seconds before the slot, 300 milliseconds later, you update it, and so on, and you increase your chances uh, to succeed. Not too many searchers are using it today, so you should, you should do, do it. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is uh, last, this is like, Looking at 1,000 bundles, I did it before it Denver, so maybe it changed a little bit. But I looked on blocks route RPC when a user are submitting bundle, and we can see that user are submitting bundle throughout the slot. Okay, uh, throughout the slot, even some bundles arrive one second after the slot time. You can see that the majority of the bundles. In terms of uh, in terms of 
uh, number arrive in the last two seconds of the slot, as expected. But we do see uh, bundles that arrive even in the beginning of the slot. But this is depending on the strategy of the searcher. So if a searcher is doing arbitrage, background, it doesn't matter. You can submit immediately. Once you see the background, you can submit immediately. If you are doing sex decks, as we discussed, you're waiting for the last uh, second of the, of the slot. Okay, as a builder, you, have a, you need to consider to which relay to submit. You pick the relay based on performance of the relay, how many validators are registering with that relay, uh, whether it's doing simulation or it's a skipping simulation, rate limit, and so on. And the last thing that I want to talk about is the validator. How many, do we have any validator stakers in here? All right, so. <laughs> so, <clears throat> latency is also important for validators, okay? Where, it's a, now it's a question that you want to ask yourself, where do you want to know, where do you want to put your infrastructure, knowing that the relay Let's assume that you know, you know, majority of the relay are in the uh, in, uh, US East. So is it better for you to be close to the relay or far from the relay? In one end, you, you, you want to be close because your biggest concern is that it's going to take time to get the bid, to get the payload, and you miss, you're going to miss the slot, OK? But if, on the other end, if you are a, if you are uh, uh, far, it's going to take a while until the builder is going to get your request. So that gives a more chance for the builder to create better block, which basically means that you are going to get higher value block. So that's also something that the uh, validator are considering. Now you can achieve that by putting your infrastructure far from the builder. You can achieve that also by delaying the get header request. The echo, the, the, echo, the community does, does not want to see validator delaying requests. They don't want to see validator delaying propagating blocks because it's not good for the environment. But as a validator, you need to think about whether it makes sense to get the, the, to get the block as soon as possible, or maybe wait, wait a little bit. <clears throat> so where do, when do validator request the, the get header, they get the bid from the relay? We are seeing average of 414. Actually, I have a, I have a histogram here. This is, first you can see that they get Get header is arriving after the slot start time, not before, which is expected. Majority comes around 400 milliseconds after the slot start time. We do get some requests that are coming 900 one second after the uh, after the slot uh, uh, start time. The the MEV boost timeout is 950 milliseconds. So validator is requesting the get header 1,000 or one second after the slow tie time lost uh, probably the opportunity, unless they are running some customized uh, uh, MEV boost. But asking 100 milliseconds after the slot uh, uh, start time might not be the best thing for a validator versus asking 400 milliseconds uh, after slot uh, start. <clears throat> Questions? I have a few more slides, but I'm not going to talk about them. So, questions? <clears throat> All right, so back to beer. Yes? You mentioned that the number of validators Number of validators connected to what? To MEV relay? Yeah. It's depending on, so 
every basically every uh, every few minutes a validator re-register re to a uh, to a relay. Some uh, validator might make a decision. We, are, we, we use Blockstart now. We're not going to use Blockstart anymore. We start using uh, ultrasound, so the uh, number change. Basically, every relay has a home page where they're showing you the number of registered validators, and you can see them. You mentioned that the searchers need to be uh, very fast. Yeah, so, so it's, but it depends. If, if you are, you're correct if you're using bundle. If you are not using bundle, if you're using private transaction, private transaction are like mempool transaction only, they are being sent to the node privately. They are not being propagated to the mempool. If you're using private transaction, it's gas price and first and uh, time of arrival. If you're using BSC, it's, there's no bundle. For Ethereum, you are correct. It's still important to get to the builder on time because if a builder if a builder takes one millisecond to build the block and you arrive after you missed. But on a so in Ethereum, it's more important to identify the trigger of a transaction. That's speed as well. Not not the execution, but the identifying the trigger. Yes. I don't think so. As a searcher, so on Ethereum, I do. I, yeah, the, yeah. The question was, as a searcher on Ethereum, if it makes sense to co-locate with a with a major builder. So, the answer I think is is yes and no. First of all, there's no there's no one major builder, so you need to co-locate with four, five, one, and you can't really co-locate with four, five, one. So what is important is that you'll be on the same region as them. You don't necessarily need to be like, we have customer that want, they run their, their bot on the same availability zone as our, our nodes. This is not that important. As long as you are on the same region that you have like one millisecond latency, that's good enough. Yeah, and if you want one region, U.S. East. All right, thank you for coming. <laughs>